Steve's put together a selection of Australian cricketers great over the fence in six and out memories in a new book called First Tests, Great Australian Cricketers and the Backyards That Made Them. Steve, welcome to breakfast. Thanks, Fran. To that side of the microphone. That's right. <laughs> uh, Steve, this is a great idea because I think nearly all of us have stories of, of backyard cricket. I remember my little brother and I pretending to be the chapels, him dancing down the pitch to me. Even the greats have these backyard stories. Definitely. And um, to me, it was the real key to, to where they came from and how they, they played. Um, if you talked about chapels, the Chapel brothers are the archetypal backyard experience. Their father played 22 years of grey cricket in Adelaide, yet he said that his sons had faced more balls in the backyard by the age of 12. And so it's that repetitive play, but not only facing so many balls, but in such a cutthroat environment. The Chapel Brothers is a classic example of that. Their father made was them... blood on the turf. There was. Their father made made them play with a hard ball from the age of two. The first time... From the age of two, what kind of father makes a two-year-old play with a cricket? <laughs> a ball? father who wants his three sons to become test cricketers. And and in one of the first times, Greg was allowed to play by Ian, Ian, who's acknowledged as one of the fiercest competitors ever in test cricket. He hit him on the fingers in one of the first balls, wrapped him on the knuckles. And poor old Greg, as about a seven or eight-year-old, was on the turf crying. And his brother came up to him and said... And his brother, he was thinking, oh, at last I'm getting some sympathy from my older brother. But Ian said to him... I wouldn't worry about the fingers if I was you. The next one will be your head. So it's that kind of cutthroat environment those guys grew up in. And so when they get to test cricket, it's the most natural environment in the world. And uh, they, the Chapels were the only brothers who no, the, forged themselves in the backyard. Well, the Wars, the Lee brothers, the Hussies, all of them played for Australia. The Wars was another cutthroat environment. Steve and Mark, the twins, were playing in a backyard in Panania on a driveway. And there was everything about that environment made it difficult to bat. I'm not surprised they became batsmen and batsmen who were good at struggling through tough times because they were they were on a, a driveway that sloped down. So the bowler could run down the hill, fire the ball in, coming down off off the off off this uh, slope. And so it made it really difficult conditions. And the the War Brothers made it even harder for themselves. Often they'd play with smaller bats to make it more difficult. And you actually know this because part of your research for the book was going to the places where these people played in the backyards or played on the streets. Just going there and seeing it physically, what did that tell you? It tells you a lot. For example, the Lee, the Lee brothers, I went to their home in Mount Warrigal. It's no longer their home. And if you look at the driveway of the Lee boys, it is so, it's is—it's like the nullaball, it's that long. And you can imagine Brett coming in off this long run, steaming in to try and get his brother out. You can also see the B&D roller door with dents in it at head height. And so when the Lee brothers' uh, parents went out, they used to get the hardball out and try and kill each other. And and apparently one roller door had to be um, discarded because that it couldn't close anymore. And the house that's there still has the ding marks. It looks like a, a, a hailstorm's hit it. And Dad's had a big role to play in a lot of these backyard games or, or street cricket games. I remember last year we spoke to Dougie Walters and he, he described his upbringing in country New South Wales, how his family collected ants' nests to roll out their own, you know, very huff, tough, very hard wicket. Here's a bit of what Dougie had to say. My mother and father both played cricket and two brothers and sister. So it was very much a, a family test match that we that we had every every spare moment we could get away from those cows. We got the tractor and trailer out and went out and dug up a few of those ants' nests and it uh, was a little uncomfortable for the first couple of days until the ants disappeared, but uh, <laughs> we had the roller and we, uh, we'd put a bit of water on it and rolled it down and it, it ended up making a, a pretty good batting surface. It was better than the backyard just... Uh, the grass in the backyard so uh yeah and i, I guess that it, it did help me uh eventually to be able to play spin bowling well something helped him with his spin bowling that's for sure Definitely. but but that that experience of dougie there with you know honing his technique and the difficult circumstances of the backyard that's something you found really contributed a lot to players star shots didn't definitely it? Uh, dougie said he became a good player of spin because that ants nest bed um turned and one of the best innings against spin bowling ever was played by doug walters at port of spain in 1973 he scored 102 out of 138 runs scored in one session when they cooked up a turning pitch with the 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 guy who ended up taking the world record for the amount of wickets, Lance Gibbs, who was an off-spin bowler. No one else can play him. Dougie scored 100. Australia won by about 40 runs. 
And all because of the answers. All because he learned how to play on a real turner. And if you look throughout the people in the book I talked to, Neil Harvey grew up in Fitzroy during the Depression in inner city Melbourne. He played on a cobblestone lane in the back of his house. And I've gone down to those cobblestones and, and thrown a ball on it. And it just darts all over the place. And his footwork and his technique was immaculate. Richie Benno said he had the best footwork of anyone he saw. And he would always charge out of his crease to get to the pitch of the ball for spinners. And he learnt a lot of this on those cobblestones. And even though Neil Harvey charged down the crease, he never in 79 tests he played ever got stumped. So these games that you play as a child really influence the way you play as a test cricketer. Which brings to mind the great story of the Don and all those hours in his backyard with a golf ball against the water stand, water tank, trying to hit it with a stump. Uh, great for his hand-eye coordination. Um and, and just a great example of that, just and his and his tenacity, just keeping at it, keeping at it, probably hit more balls than any other cricketer. That's right. And a real example of Bush ingenuity too, because he had this golf golf ball, the stump, and the way the ball darted off off the uh, the base of the tank stand meant it came back really fast at him. So he had to concentrate intensely to hit that ball. But also it developed a unique technique that no one else really has ever had in the game. And, and physicists call it the rotary technique where his stump goes out to gully and he gets into position faster than anyone else. And everyone thought Don Bradman had a better eye. All his contemporaries said his eye was better than everyone. But an Adelaide professor tested his eyesight and found it below average compared to other students. And what it was, this tank stand drill taught him to get into position to face the ball faster than anybody else. It also taught him to concentrate. And it was incredibly efficient because it was played under cover because it was out near his outdoor laundry, so he could play when it was raining. There was three uh, there was three walls, so he didn't have to chase the ball all the time. And if he was down the park playing with his mates, there's no way he would have faced as many balls mm. as he would by just throwing it up against the tank stand. And as you say, it's a great example of the ingenuity of them all. Another cricket great, but certainly much less known one, is the tale of Betty Wilson. I'd never heard of Betty, but she sure could bat, thanks to an ingenious device that she cooked up with a, a stocking in the clothesline. Yeah, everyone should know more about Betty because she has a test batting average of 50 and a, and a 57 and a bowling average of around 11. And her, she started playing cricket as a 10-year-old in wim, senior women's cricket. She started playing in the streets, she graduated to women's cricket and she got hit in the stomach very early on in her career. And her dad said, I'm going to, everyone wanted her to stop playing because they thought she shouldn't be playing with women. And her dad said, let's get into the backyard. And he got one of um, her mother's old cotton stockings, put the ball in the stocking, threw it around the clothesline and she would hit the ball and she would lower it and, 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 and heighten it according to what shot she wanted to play. And she would get into a whole full kit and just play the ball and keep playing it and playing it. In the it. backyard in a full kit. And she did it till the age of 38 when she retired from Test Cricket. And Betty's still alive. She lives in Clifton Hill in Melbourne and she's still got the stocking in her garage. And recently she was coaching young young women to play the game and she suggested the stocking to them. And apparently they all laughed. But it worked for Betty. And it worked for Don Bradman, these similar techniques. Take a tip, girls. Get That's to right. the clothesline with the stocking. <laughs> um, one thing that struck me as I read through this is n not just, I mean, all driven sports people will play sort of, you know, day in, day out in their backyard if they can, if they get that opportunity. But a lot of these people were really playing with not great equipment. There's stories of people fashioning the ball out of chunks of wood. And, mm. and then I noticed with the, with the Don, uh, he, he somehow got hold of an old cricket bat, which his dad had to cut three inches off for yeah. him. Some people were playing just with blocks of wood. Exactly. Richie Benno started with a bat made out of packing case timber. Mike Hussey started with a plank of wood out the back of his house and his dad was throwing gravel out at him. Uh, Bill O'Reilly, the great Australian leg spinner, started with, f for a ball, he used a, a, a Banksia root, which had been ground down. So a lot of these guys started out with quite medieval equipment. So you don't need the best equipment to, to play for Australia. Luxury. <laughs> Not so Adam Gilchrist, though. His father created a virtual cricket field. Yeah. AstroTurf and That's everything. right. Stan Gilchrist had played New South Wales second 11 cricket um, and he, he in his backyard at Lismore, they started with a concrete pitch. He laid some astroturf down onto that pitch. He put some nets up. Then he got a bowling machine. Then he got video technology. He was, must have been one of the first backyards to have a video camera. And his father just kept throwing balls at him and his mum used to feed balls into the, um, into the bowling machine. And this is one of the great stories in the book for me is the role that parents play with these cricketers because they, all these parents have worn out shoulders throwing balls at them, taking them down the nets, travelling them, travelling around the country with these kids. But yeah, the Gilchrist backyard <laughs> is like a sporting academy.